welcome to the Private Investors Podcast, the podcast where keen stock pickers Mark Atkinson and Maynard Payton talk about managing their share portfolios. Mark began buying shares in 1984, while I started in 1993. This time we cover Greg's and the investment potential of sausage rolls. Let's get started. Mark, stock market conditions remain pretty rough, but you are still buying. You've told me you have been topping up on Greg's. Yeah, I keep plowing on, returning to an old friend, Greg's, ticker symbol G. First bought it back in 2017. We're back at £10.24. I did several times, latest time being beginning of this month, at just under £18, 17.999. So I bought that down as £18. So I've always associated Greg's with sausage rolls, but the chain sells quite a range of food now, but no longer sells bread. No, they took the decision quite a number of years ago to dispense with bread. I think it's seen as a commodity item. It's a staple and it's a loss leader with supermarkets. So I think they've looked at that and thought, you can have that business. We'll target things with higher margins. So what's going to help Greg's survive in the recession that's on its way? One of the things that I'm looking at, not just with Greg's, but across the way people are adapting their spending is people trading down. We're already seeing the likes of Lidl and Aldi benefiting from this phenomenon. People are cutting back on joints of meat and chops, things like that. They're gravitating to chicken and sausages and things like that. So I think that's a, another trend that we can look at is that the pound conscious consumer may well revert to Greg's. When money's tight, what people look at is the high cost items to cut back on the holiday, the new car, the, uh, the new three piece suite. Are you going to really cut back on your sausage roll or your pasta or your cup of coffee? Yeah. I think the spend per transaction in Greg's is just three pounds. So. I think people will still visit the Greggs. Something that could help Greggs in a recession are its loyal customers. Have you heard about these Greggs super fans? Some of them seem quite obsessed with Greggs and the food. Yeah, it's like a marketing masterclass, isn't it? It's, it's unlike almost any other business uh, in that people get tattoos and they wear Greggs clothing now and they go around ticking off the Greggs stores. So it's, it's really like a, a phenomenon, really. I mean, most companies would die for customer loyalty where your customers are devoted to your products that they get a tattoo or branded clothing. It's almost like football, isn't it? That's the only, the only comparable. Yeah. That's an interesting comparison it is that kind of devotion, that kind of loyalty where people stretch to that kind of interaction with a business. I can't think of many other businesses like this. I've done a few, one or two searches on the internet. Mark Anderson from Liverpool, he goes to Greg's dressed head to toe in Greg's branded clothing. So. He's got the hat, the shirt, the shorts, the socks, and the Crocs. Right, okay. Which is a, let's say it's a, a distinctive look. Yeah. I like the business, but I don't think I'd stretch that far. Yeah, I think you need a, a certain style to carry that off. Or there's a lady called Megan Topping, 27 from Manchester. Now she's got an ambition to order a sausage roll in every Greg's shop around the country, which sounds like a, a bit of a journey, but emphasizes the devotion of some people to this, uh, this company, the food. The rate at which they're expanding, she'll never finish that job. No, I think that's, I think it's a never ending journey. Apparently she spends 300 pounds a month on Greg's, which sounds a lot. She claims she's eaten 10,000 sausage rolls since the age of 10 mm. and she's, she's 27 now. She's, so. she's doing a, a sterling job. She's doing a sterling job. I, she really is. I'm not sure what's the most interesting fact about her, whether she spends 300 pounds a month at Greg's or apparently she weighs just eight stone seven after Ooh, eating okay. 10, after eating 10,000 sausage rolls. So maybe Greg's can be part of a, a calorie controlled diet. I don't know. Maybe yeah. she just eats sausage rolls. That's, yeah. But I wonder if some shareholders are super fans because this has been a great long-term performer. The company floated in 1984, the equivalent of 13 pence per share and the shares now are 18 pounds. So they're up 138 times in almost 40 years, which works out at something like 14% a year. And you throw on dividends as well, and you can probably get towards 20%, especially if you sold out last year at 35 pounds. Yeah. The 20% a year over almost 40 years, that is Warren Buffett type returns, really. You started investing in 1984. Did you not think of looking at Greg's back then when it floated? No, I, I didn't. It wasn't on my radar, but I have held it once previously. I bought back in August, 2003, way back then at three pounds and seven pence. And I sold in November, 2005 at four pounds 60, making a 50% profit there. And, uh, and I've kept these records, but I didn't know back then that I'd be appearing on a, a podcast and I've not really put any narrative as to when, why I really sold it. I don't know why I actually got out, whether I thought I'd, 
I just took a profit at the time or there was something better coming along. I haven't done the paper trail on where those funds actually went, but I've got a nagging feeling that I should have just stayed the cover. I'm looking at the share pad, share price chart now. And yes, it's a few shares would have done as well as Greg's over since you've sold back then. Yeah. It has been a, a fantastic before. The profits when it floated was just 2 million. And last year they were 140 something million pound profit. And you look at the charts for the, the sales. The sales seems to have grown every year for a decade. The same with the dividend. I think the dividend has been held once or twice, but it's just upwards. Aside from the pandemic, I mean, there were sales set, setbacks in the pandemic, but the long-term track record is pretty impressive. Net cash, rarely used any debt. There's freeholds, property and return on equity. Sharep, I'd say it's 20% a year. So pretty impressive stuff. Things like the revenue per shop. That's increased over the last one or two decades. From 20 years ago, it's 300K per shop. Now it's almost 600K. So, which works at about 3 to 4% a year, which doesn't sound much every year, 3 to 4%, but every year in, year out, a 3 to 4% improvement on your sales. It's just that compounds up and it really underpins the, uh, the long term performance of the company. I think they're making operational improvements all the time, just selling a little bit more product from every shop every year. And it just all adds up. So it's almost machine like what they've done. But you yeah. look at the financial charts it's almost grinding out like a steamroller just grinding out small improvements every year and it really adds up to a really great share price performance yeah it's that, that phrase making the assets sweat isn't it you mentioned revenue per store and one of the big things that they've targeted is the breakfast market they've expanded the working hours on that end of the day and it's something that they're looking to do with the evenings they've targeted that is another area in which they can get that asset working just that little bit more yeah, that, that's all part of the, uh, the big five-year plan, which will come on into a second. But I'm going to go back in time to John Gregg, who started the whole company in the 1930s. I think one of what supported the company over time is its sort of family history. So John Gregg started the company in the 1930s and his son, Ian Gregg, took charge in the 60s. And he was in charge for about 30 years. And there's an interesting interview with Ian Gregg in the Scotsman newspaper. And he says, I've always believed in, Greg's has gone along these lines. If you look after your customers and you look after your staff, then your shareholders will do very well. And that's important, looking after your staff in a retail business, because the staff generally in retail are lowly paid. They deal with the general public all the time. And it can be difficult to motivate such staff. And if you look after your staff, they can give better customer service and the customers are more likely to come back the next day rather than next door to, to buy, buy their sausage rolls. There's a 10% profit share for staff at Greg's. That's been there for years. And I reckon that makes a heck of a difference to this company mm. where the message is to the staff, if you sell more food, you're going to earn more money. That's it. So they're just going to be more motivated to generate more sales from the store and give better customer service. And I think that's the big difference between many other retailers, between Greg's and other retailers, where other retailers are floundered because they're just not treated the staff. Yeah, there's greater engagement, isn't there? Yeah. So what do you think of Greg's management now? Because the management has changed as a new chief exec. Yeah, a new chief executive, but she's come from in-house and she's got 12 years experience in the business. And she seemed to have been, she's come from the, the HR side and then she's been involved on the retail and property side, which is a, a big side of the business. And I think she's been working at, alongside the previous CEO quite closely. So it looks to me like a, something of a seamless transition. Yeah, I think as these changes go, it's been, it's pretty attractive. She's not an MBA type. This is what appeals to me. She's not an MBA type with experience only of spreadsheets and PowerPoints. She's got shop floor experience. In the annual report, there's a Q and A section and she's asked, where were you before Greg's? And she says, I joined Greg's from Asda. When I was a student at Strathclyde University, I worked as a checkout supervisor at my local branch a couple of nights a week. My manager thought I showed potential and made me deputy manager. After I graduated, I joined their graduate scheme and spent 20 years there working my way up to become their people director, first for the retail side, then for distribution. So she's worked on the shop floor yeah, yeah. from an early age. And you think you've got that experience of dealing with the public and working her way up to become the people director. So she knows how to handle staff and how to motivate staff at ASDA, which is pretty impressive and just what you want really for a, a boss of a, a 
big retail chain such as Greg's. So if she's in charge of this five-year plan. What do you think of this five-year plan where are expanding into, you must be bullish about breakfast, evening, selling all sorts of different food now, not just uh, sausage rolls. Yeah, I think it's just an, an exciting business really in that the, the options that it's got. It's not as though it's just looking for rolling out more shops and that's the, where the growth is going to come from. There's other routes to market and other avenues in which it can grow the business. You've got the, uh, the tie up with Just Eat. There's a 1,180 stores where you can get your deliveries done digitally. There's the expanding of concessions in the likes of Asda and Tesco. They're only small at the moment, but those are getting bigger. They've got retail parks, roadside, rail and airport, even London underground, petrol forecourts industrial estates, supermarkets, universities and hospitals, and now central London. That's opening up to them because they, previously they've been priced out of that. That's going to be another massive market that they're going to attack. And as I mentioned earlier on the uh, expanding of the evening trade, 35% of food on the go is after four o'clock. And that Greg's have only got 1% of that market, whereas they've got 10% of the lunchtime and 16.5% of the breakfast market. I'm not convinced about the evening side of things. I looked at that five-year plan PowerPoint, the Capital Markets Day PowerPoint. They say they're going to generate an extra 180 million of sales opening up in the evenings based, and that's versus 1,200 million of sales now. So it's an extra 15% from sales in the evenings from walk-ins and delivery. And when you think that the shops are already open perhaps 12 hours a day at the moment, and the extra, you add on an extra two hours, so that's an extra 17% in opening time. So you get an extra 15% in sales in the evening from opening the shops 17% longer. So I think some of the shops are not going to open in the evening. So I think two, only two thirds are. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't suggest to me that the sales per hour in the evening are going to be much greater than they are during the day. And when you think about the higher price points of food they're going to sell in the evening, I think pizzas and chicken goujons, which are more expensive than your sausage rolls. So I'm not totally convinced about their sums, but that's just my impression of what their presentation suggested. The funny thing about that presentation was it was in October, 2021, they gave this grand plan for the next five years. And that was announced by the previous chief exec. And then three months later, he goes and retires. Yeah. So that's all a bit odd, isn't it? When, you know, why is that? Why? He was coming up to retirement age anyway, but I suppose if you've got a new CEO, it, perhaps if it came in from the previous CEO, it comes with his blessing. He had a very good track record. If you had a new CEO come in and then from day one, it's right, we're going to expand the business in five years, then would that have spooked the market? I don't know. You may give the new CEO some wiggle room because if the plan completely fails, she can say, well, it was my predecessor who presented it. But if you look at the Q&A in the annual report, there's a question there that says, what's first on the to-do list as Greg's chief executive? And the new chief exec replies, Roger, who was the previous chief exec. Roger and I have a shared vision for Greg's future because we've already been working on it together for years. But mm. I'm a bit worried about the cost. There's a hundred slides in this PowerPoint, all talking about growth plans and sales funnels and pie charts and IT implementation. And there's just one slide dedicated to the cost, which was just this little bar chart in the left hand corner. And you think, why aren't you talking about the cost a bit more? And the actual numbers are only disclosed in the RNS on the day, right down at the bottom. And you think, why are you not telling us about the cost of all these new stores? So the, what I calculate is over the next five years, they're going to spend 178 million pounds a year on these new stores and infrastructure. And that compares to 70 million pounds a year in the, a year for the previous five years. So they're going to spend an extra 500 million pounds over the next five years, which is a lot of money, a, a big step up in investment. And you think, well, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to generate suitable returns on this money? And they're going to plan to open 800 more stores by spending almost 900 million pounds. So it's a million pounds plus per store. And the existing stores are about, they've cost 360,000 pounds. That includes all the other assets as well. So all this big expenditure with the extra manufacturing sites, distribution centers, and relocating and refurbishing all these shops. 
the cost is, is arguably tripling. The cost per store is arguably tripling, but the total sales from the state is just doubling. So there's a lot of upfront capex here and the returns on capital over the next five years plus, I don't think are going to be anything like what we've seen previously are going to be somewhat lower. And the fact that they didn't really mention the cost in the, the presentation is a bit disturbing because if it was going to be great, you'd think there'd be hundreds of slides about how return on capital is going to improve, but they don't even mention it at all. Yeah. It makes you wonder where we'll get to with the saturation point of where it is on the stores. And I went on their website. I live in East Lancashire and we've got quite a bit of green belts here. We're not in built up in a city. So I went on their website and within an eight mile radius of where I live, there's 19 stores. That sounds a lot, doesn't that it? That sounds a lot. But, but I think you can go back in time and think, oh, there's, there was 10 stores maybe 10 years ago. And you think that's the limit. But they are expanding into different areas. This part of this plan is to expand into railway stations and universities. That sounds quite encouraging, I think, because of the high footfall. Yeah, yeah. As the high street's declining, they can keep, they've got the abilities, they're agile and nimble to, to move to where people are congregated. There was an example in the presentation about in Newcastle, they've got an established store in the middle of Newcastle. And just across the road is the train station. And they've opened up a new store in the train station and it's not affected the store just across the road. They're still doing the same sales. So saturation may some way off. I think it's been a worry for years. I think you can go back 20 years and people will be worrying about, oh, how many stores can you open? And it's just the market has increased and other competitors have just faded over time. And there's supposed to be in that market of making sandwiches or a lot of mom and pop businesses out there still. Yeah, but they are probably struggling now. If you're an independent, you've just had the pandemic, so you're still reeling from the pandemic. And now you've got all these other costs coming through, inflation and energy costs. And it's just a, a rough time for in, your independent. They're trying to open 800 more stores and they've got 2,000 now. So they're trying to get to beyond 3,000. And it's a bold move, I think. But it could be the right time. Competition is weak. Property is pretty cheap or cheaper than it has been. And uh, if you're going to go big on your estates and try and become a really big player in convenience food, then now may be the best time to go for that plan. But it's a bold move and it's expensive. About 20% of their stores are franchises, aren't they? And they've got about a dozen partners. So they're prepared to go on the journey with them. They seem to be sold on the idea. Franchise shops don't make as much money for Greg's as the company owned shops. But I do think you need, maybe it's, that's the only way in to get into railway stations. Cause I think a lot of them are franchised and the universities and the re, these uh, retail estates as well. So yeah, that's another thing to be, to look at because they don't make as much money as the company stores. And so you're going to get lower returns of capital through these franchises. More of this, more of the shops are going to be franchised now through this uh, five-year plan than the, uh, than previously. So that's something to watch out for. Yeah, the biggest partner on the franchise side is Euro Garages, and they've got about 200 of the 400 franchises. And last year they bought a company called Couplins Bakery, where they're based in the Northeast, predominantly Yorkshire and the, the Northeast. I'm just wondering, what's the, is that a potential threat there that whereby would we carry on with the Greg's franchises if we've got our own bakery chain? I remember going into Couplins years ago. I think if you own Couplins, it would be your, to your advantage to remain a Greg's franchisee because then you can see what they're doing if you've got the best or one of the best convenience food retailers if you're on the inside as a franchisee you could then think oh how can i improve my own bakery so they're probably operating with different franchise concepts and just seeing which one's the best and what they can learn with their own their own chain yeah but i there's a kpi return on capital employed that's an official kpi in the annual report and i think i should be looking at that over the next few years to see what the trend is. I think is going to go a lot lower. So the directors, they have these performance share plans, which is essentially, you get these options, but the plan in the last annual report just shows a, a earnings figure of 77 pence. So if earnings are at least 77 pence, the directors get these options, which sounds fine until you look at what the earnings were last year, which were 116 pence. So it looks to me like the directors get these options, even if earnings fall by a third over the next few years, the directors will still get these options, which sounds ridiculous. And it's the same, there's another option target for return on capital, which is at least 
if it's at 15 percent or more they get these options and last year return on capital employed was 23 percent so again if return on capital drops by a third over the next few years they get these options again which is ridiculous i think because it implies that the board thinks that the financials in one or two years time are going to be worse than they were last year which is not encouraging for this five-year plan and the fact that they're not really disclosed much about the cost of this five-year plan so it's just a little bit worrying i think this uh, this small op this option plan they've got we're a year into the five-year plan so i would imagine it's so as we get down the road we'll, we'll find out how they're doing with that target yeah, because, yeah, but it's, I think with direct to pay, you can always look at the small print and think, what do the board think is possible? So you have mm. these broker forecasts and the chairman statement saying, you oh, know, oh, things are going great. But you look at direct to pay and the option targets or bonus targets, and that can probably tell you more about what's likely to happen at a business than any broker forecast because they've all agreed. So the non-execs, the remuneration committee and the executives have all said, yeah, 77 pence, that's a fair threshold for our options, which is not great when you've made more than 100 pence in the last few years. Shall we talk about those August results, first half results? Yeah, what first half, like for like sales were up, about, were up at 22.4%, 20, overall sales were up 27.1%, but profit was flat, as I think inflationary pressures are creeping through they are creeping through i think not creeping they're marching aren't they? they're marching uh, through but they they've maintained the dividend but that was surprising because they previously had a special dividend I, I don't understand this special dividend they've paid one or two special dividends before but why pay a special dividend when you've just announced a big five-year expansion plan why spend even more money giving out money to shareholders when you've just announced a almost a 900 million pound plan to expand the estate. I don't understand why you would pay out a special dividend, especially now with the economy. Yeah. They've still got 156, 146 million pounds worth of cash on the books. Yeah. Oh, they, they must think that gives them sufficient scope to fund the growth. Yeah. The, ca the cash is, a lot of that is just not having not paid suppliers because it's all just a reflection. The, the customers pay up front and they yeah. pay their suppliers a bit later. So, yeah, I don't think it's surplus cash as such, but yeah, they do have cash. It's just, it's one of those things where it just looks a bit odd paying that special dividend after you've just announced a big expansion plan. So yeah, it, it suggests they're confident, but I'm not so sure. I don't yeah. know. They did report actually in, in a post period that the, the like for like sales in the four weeks up to the end of July was up 13.1%. Yeah. And uh, we've got a, another trading update coming around the corner on the 4th of October. So we'll know a bit more then. Yeah. You've got to compare like for likes, what they announced in, in the October to, to that 12% figure you've just mentioned. So yeah, that's, it'd be interesting to see the like for likes. You've got the difficulty is you don't know how things were trading in 2021. I can't remember if we were in a lockdown or not. It's all a bit vague. I think over the last three years, three or four years, it all translates to like for likes of between three and four percent mm. so the pre-pandemic to now which is just in line with that long-term trend of yeah, three yeah. to four percent that's just remarkable how the business is even with a pandemic up and down it's just come out at three to four percent all the improvements of all point to that underlying growth rate i did look at the small print in august in the august results and it's just the tone they've said customer transaction numbers remaining below pre-pandemic levels and they also talk about a risk uplift for uncertainty of future cash flows in the impairment small print as well. So the tone of the small print perhaps is a little bit gloomier than the German's narrative, I think. And uh, talking about cost of living pressures as well, that was never mentioned in the earlier annual report. Cost of living never mentioned at all. And now it's a risk factor in this in the small print. So you just get the feeling the current ec economic climate is not creeping but marching through into the uh, into the accounts here so are these shares really cheap then at 18 pounds persuade me mark I'll, I'll tell you again in another 12 months i just look at the long-term trend and they say the trend is your friend and just because what's happened before it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen again and i'm just looking at the long-term track record and i just think they'll keep on being able to squeeze that a little bit more out it's, they've got deeper pockets than a lot of their competition they got the price offering. I went into a, a Greg's that was in the Shell garage at the weekend. 
and I got a bacon roll and a coffee for three pounds fifteen. That's a lot cheaper than a lot of other places. You could probably just get the a dr that would just pay for a drink. It's for people who are price conscious. I think that's a benefit. I think they're very ad adaptable. They're agile and nimble. They can move quickly. When they mentioned about the opening of the stores, they said that they've they close a number of stores or relocate them to get to better advantage places that are more advantageous in the town centre, say, where the footfall's a bit better or they've got better rents. So they can move very quickly. And this is like a machine that they can, they can adapt very swiftly to market conditions. I can understand why you hold Greg's because the long-term track records, fantastic, but buying after this capital markets day and the five-year plan, I'm not so sure. And also 18 pounds, you're paying 15 times earnings, I think a 3% year. So it's not the obvious bargain. It perhaps it once was during the pandemic lows, especially now in difficult market conditions, there's lots of other companies trading on much lower ratings on this one. I just don't see why you've bought to be brutally frank. Okay. I don't, I could understand. We talked about Sumero yep. last time and that had a 6% yield and you think, okay, that's interesting. We talked about photo me, which where the boss had bought 20 million pounds of shares. You think, ah, oh, that's interesting, but I don't get the same interest with Greg's right now at 18 pounds. If the five-year plan comes off, they double sales with a 10% margin, which might be generous. I reckon you can get to earnings of almost two pounds per share, which you're buying at 18 pounds is nine times earnings five years out. And when you look around the market now, there's loads of shares on single digit multiples, especially smaller companies. You think why pay nine times earnings five years out when you can pay nine times earnings for today's earnings? I can see us having a little bit of a side wager on this one. Yeah. Yes. Let's see where we are in a few years. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see. I suspect yeah. the company will do well. Whether the share price is already reflecting some growth or I don't know, but yeah, we, we had a nice email from a, another investor called Matt. Uh, and he was saying how much he enjoyed the summer or one, and he actually sent us some good information on warehousing and logistics and distribution, which is his background, which was very much appreciated. But he asked the question about, was the one things that swung decision in making a purchase, a key deciding technique. And I gave this a little bit of thought and actually thinking Greg's case, it's the, just the options that it's, it's got, but it doesn't, it's not bound just by the high street. It's got. It can attack retail parks, roadside, airports, industrial estates. You know, I think that's a very interesting market to go for because previously that's just been the preserve of your know, Tom Dick or Harry with a catering van. And the, I remember the first time I saw Greg's, it, it looked a little bit incongruous on an industrial estate. But if you're, you've traveled to an industrial estate somewhere that you're not familiar with, and it's a familiar brand, you know what you're getting, this consistency of product. So I think that's there must be a massive market by these mobile catering vans that somebody can tap into. And I don't think anybody else has targeted it, not from the kind of corporate side anyway. Yeah, I think it's got a it's scope to take away a lot of business from smaller operators, one man bands, greasy spoon vans, high street, individual high street bakeries, shops. I think the management have decided let's go big and we could open up all these stores, generate even greater economies of scale. And there'll be just a few big chains left and the independents are all going to go into struggle unless they're really good. I can see Greg's as a business doing well as an investment right now. I've not bought into Greg's, not this time. <laughs> okay. What do you think now? Are you still going to buy more or just hold on? The last time I just topped up previous to December, 2019. So that's where I just keep looking at the portfolio rebalancing. So I'll probably leave that alone for a little while. And it accounts for like 5% of the portfolio. It's one of the core holdings, but so it's, I wouldn't be deterred at these kind of prices. So it's a big holding. It's a big yeah, holding. I didn't realize it was a, uh, one of your larger shares. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's about fourth or fifth in the portfolio. Thanks for listening to the private investors podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please let us know by liking, subscribing, or even leaving a review until next time. Thank you. And goodbye. One thing I've forgotten to ask you, Mark. Yeah. Is whether you are a Greg super fan yourself. I wouldn't describe myself as a super fan. I do occasionally go into Greg's. I certainly wouldn't have a tattoo of a Greg's logo or a, a sausage roll. I suppose if I did have a tattoo, it would be a, being in the stock market, a bull and a bear, having a struggle or something like that.